All right, so uh, let's get going on uh, today's class. So uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to finish up. We've got just a little bit left uh, to take a look at in terms of connectionist networks. And then we're going to go on to a new area, uh, which is linguistics, which is one of the kind of foundational areas for cognitive science, uh, a minor that we offer here at IUSB, that kind of fits in very well with uh, cognitive psychology. So uh, we'll take a look at that kind of important uh, aspect of understanding how our mind works and understanding something that is uh, not as uniquely human as people once thought, but definitely something that we uh, kind of have a special ability to do amongst living, thinking things. So uh, to finish up our look at connectionist networks, we uh, took a look last time at a network that can uh, recognize uh, numbers, even if they are degraded stimuli, like that one up there. And uh, what we saw was that each of these little pixels here, if you break this picture down, you can break it down into 784 pixels. Each of those pixels has an input unit, and that input unit has connections to hidden units, and those hidden units have connections to output units. And those connections can either be these blue connections, which are positive connections, they increase the likelihood that whatever they're gonna, uh, that whatever they're connected to is gonna fire, or they can uh, be these red connections, which are inhibitory connections, negative connections, which decrease the ability of whatever they're connected to uh, firing, or you might not even be connected to each other. Some units are not connected to any other units. And what happens is this input activation sends its, uh, it sends its messages to these hidden units. These hidden units either get activated or remain inactive, send their messages to another layer of hidden units. These hidden units either become activated or stay inactivated, send their uh, outputs. And then depending upon which one of these outputs is the highest, the highest in the output level, that's the one that gets activated. So this is an example of where this seven was misidentified by this network as a number five. And then importantly, this is how this network develops. Initially, what a uh, programmer will do or a researcher will do is they will set up the units, they'll set up random connections, right? So they'll just say, randomize the weights, randomize positive and negative, randomize all the connections. And then they'll start feeding this program input and seeing what the output is. And then importantly, once the output comes out, if it's incorrect, what they will do is they will decide how to correct this. So for example, this five needs to have a lot less activation. This seven needs to have a lot more activation. This six is fine where it is, right? We don't want the six to be activated when we're looking at a seven. And then through a process known as back propagation, they will start with what they want the output to be, and they will send a signal that adjusts the weights of these connections all the way back to the weights on the input. And that back propagation is the way that this network uh, corrects itself, the way that this network is learned. And one of the big kind of pluses of networks like these, of connectionist networks. And one of the re uh, main reasons why they've been so exciting for uh, psychologists is because um, unlike a lot of other representations, the jump from representation to implementation seems very easily or straightforwardly done for these connectionist networks. So if you recall the pandemonium network, if you recall the one with demons, uh, in different rooms, watching different TVs and sending out different cell phone calls to their connected demons. You might say, all right, that's a very effective way of thinking about letter recognition at the representational level, at the level of let's just deal with the theory of how your mind might work. But connection, is, well, but then the next step, how does your brain actually implement that, uh, that uh, pandemonium model? That's a little less clear because we know there's not demons running around in our brains, literally, with little mini cell phones uh, making these calls. So there seems to be a large gap, oftentimes, between the representational level and the implementation level. However, that gap does not seem as long for connectionist networks, because this is the representational level 
of a connect, of understanding a connectionist network. This is a representational level understanding of how we recognize numbers. But it doesn't take a large jump to say, all right, well, this is a representational level. How might we, how might we implement this? Well, these connections and these units look a lot like neurons. And we have neurons in our brain. Neurons in our brain have excitatory connections, like these positive blue connections. Neurons in our brains have inhibitory connections, like these red connections. So it's almost one of the really promising things in connectionist networks is that the jump from understanding how your mind works to understanding how it's actually done in your brain seems to be a lot smaller with connectionist networks. And they have done studies where they have simulated um, lots of things uh, in, a, in a connectionist network, and it seems to parallel a lot of what actually goes on in our mind. So, for example, they had connectionist networks that were trying to use grammar. And a connectionist network that is trying to use grammar will um, oftentimes uh, learn special cases. So it'll, it'll learn things like, you know, the, um, uh, the uh, control is the verb. What's the past tense? And it will learn. Control is the past tense. Uh, pick is the verb. What's the past tense? And it will learn. Picked is the past tense. And then early on in the network, if you give it run as the input, it will learn the special case. It will learn ran as the special output, as the special irregular verb. But as it learns more and more and more, eventually it will overgeneralize. And instead of saying ran, it will then say run, runned. Instead of saying taught, it'll then say teached, right? It'll miss, it'll overgeneralize its use of um, uh, the ED for the past tense and forget about all those special cases that uh, it once knew. And if you take a look at uh, developmental psychology and how children learn language, that happens in children as well. So children at one point will say, oh, I ran to school, I ran to the store. And then a month later, they'll start saying things like, oh, I run there and I run over here because of this phenomenon. So it does seem to uh, map out a lot of things and match a lot of things that our human brains and our human minds actually do. Interestingly, though, the one glaring huge difference, there's a few differences, but the one that's really big uh, in terms of uh, this, uh, these networks, is that back propagation. So if you have to point to the one major difference between how our brains and neurons work and how these connectionist networks work, it's that that idea of sending a signal from the output and back propagating it backwards, activation, and then correcting for the units, that's actually the least like what our brains actually do. Our brains actually don't back propagate in that manner. All right, so that was for uh, number recognition. We also mentioned how these, these connectionist networks are now allowing us to have um, driverless vehicles that can actually navigate very successfully. And uh, I did want to show you one example of a kind of network in action. So this is going to be a video about uh, a network that can actually play Super Mario World and is actually a very good uh, player at Super Mario World. So let's take a look at that and see exactly how uh, this was achieved uh, for, this, um, for this network. Welcome back, Seplin here. You're watching a skilled player play Super Mario World, but this player is not human. It's a computer program I wrote called Mario. This program started out knowing absolutely nothing about Super Mario World or Super Nintendos, in fact, it didn't even know that pressing right on the controller would make the player go towards the end of the level. It learned all of these things through a process called neuroevolution. In this video, I want to teach you about how Mario learned to beat this level, Donut Plains 1, what his brain looks like, and how it's all based on actual biological evolution. So let's start out by actually looking at Mario's brain. Let's play it again, but this time we'll look at Mario's brain as it's making the decisions of what buttons to press. It's going to look a bit complicated at first, but don't worry, I'll help break it down for you. All right, so he'll break it down in just a bit. I'll break it down right now. Just real quick, let's get rid of this thing right here. All right, so this 
is your input level right here. This is your input. So it's actually a two by two input uh, uh, level here. And what this is, is every single pixel here is coded here. So this square here represents this square right here. These are the connections and the hidden units that are in the network. And then this is your output. And this is basically the options that you have on the Nintendo controller. You can either press up, press down, press left, press right. You can press A, B, X, or Y. Those are your options in this game. And you'll notice that in this case, what's going on here is uh, I believe left, left is not being activated because you're going right. Right is being activated. You can see there's almost no connections to down. And if you played Mario, I don't think down does anything, does it? No. So why would it even have you know, the down there. So once again, it kind of learned on the fly. Whoops. This structure of colored lines and blinking boxes is called a neural network. It's a simple mathematical model for how a brain works, but it can produce some very complicated behavior. With enough computational power, a neural network could come close to simulating a real human brain, but modern technology isn't there yet. On the left side, you have the inputs. This is what Mario sees. It's a simplified view of the level. The white squares stand for blocks the player can stand on, and the black squares stand for moving objects like enemies or mushrooms. On the right side, you have the outputs. These are the eight buttons that Mario is able to press by using its neural network. In between the inputs and the outputs, all those lines and boxes, those are the neural network. Each free-floating box is called a neuron, and the lines connecting those boxes are like the axons and dendrites in a human brain. At any given time, only some of these neurons and connections are actually being used. And this is what people talk about when they say you only use 10% of your brain. The neural network you're seeing is a pretty complicated one, and it got so complicated as a result of a 24-hour evolutionary learning session. So to explain how neural networks work, let's rewind about 24 hours and look at how the whole process started. This is what Mario looked like at the beginning of his training session, all the way back in generation number zero. The program is probably even dumber than you thought at this point. Often it just stands there and doesn't even press any buttons. If Mario stands still for too long, it'll cut off the simulation and try the next neural network. So it's more. Okay, so he mentioned that this was the first iteration. This was the first, uh, you, you saw the first uh, number of runs. And that flashing was them resetting the simulation. So that flashing was them basically saying, all right, here's your opportunity. Oh, you're not moving. Let's try again. Here's your opportunity. Oh, you're not moving. Let's try again. Here's your opportunity. Oh, you're not moving. Let's try again. And uh, eventually, the computer or the program decides to just randomly press another button. And then it gets a little bit further. So this is literally like if somebody did not know what a video game was and you gave them a controller in their hands, they might just sit there looking at the screen for a while until they're like, oh, this is, I'm supposed to use this. Oh, okay, I'll start playing, you know, and using my controller. So it started using the controller eventually. Just jumping from one simulation to the next. But occasionally the neural network says to press the right button and the player starts walking right. Behavior isn't complicated, but it's enough to make at least some progress at the level. Let's take a look at a sample neural network to understand just how that works. This is one of the randomly generated neural networks that appeared in the first generation of the simulation. There are some green lines and a red line and one neuron in the middle. Here's how it works. A green line is a positive connection and a red line is a negative connection. A green line reading from a black or white square will turn its output the same color. A red line reading from a black or white square will turn its output the opposite color. In this case, the green lines read from the platform that the player is standing on and make the neural network press the right button as long as the player is standing on it. <coughs> However, when the red line reads a black square representing one of those keeps koopas, it presses the A button and makes the player jump. This, uh, this puts the player in a position where the green lines are no longer reading a white square, so the right button turns off and Mario just stands there. This is a really basic example that illustrates how a more complicated neural network might operate. The more lines and neurons you have, the more nuanced the decisions can be. So, how exactly do we get those more complicated neural networks? The answer is evolution. When Mario gets further right on the screen, its fitness goes up. In this case, fitness is a function of how far right it gets and how quickly it gets there. Only the neural networks that produce the highest fitness are selected to be bred, 
creating the next generation. It took 34 generations of genetic breeding and fitness evaluation before Mar-IO was able to finish the level without dying. All right, so once again, I mentioned that you know they uh, these neural networks oftentimes see uh, seem to mimic the learning patterns that individuals that uh, humans have, and this is a very nice example of it. So if you look at the fitness per generation, this fitness here is basically how far did Mario get in this particular uh, in this particular run, and you can see that at the beginning, not very not very far at all, right? The fitness was very low at the beginning, but the program, the network learned. And so I'm assuming here, this is the max fitness it, it completed the level. Notice that much like human beings and other gamers will, will know exactly what I'm talking about here, there were times when Mar-IO got stuck, right? This time over here, you can see multiple iterations, no increase in fitness. This time here, multiple iterations, no increase in fitness. And that is exactly what happens when you're playing a game and you get stuck at a level. You just can't beat that boss. You just can't find that door. I don't know, you know, you don't know what to do until you find it and then rapid increase until you get stuck at the next level and then rapid increase until you get stuck at the next level, which is a very human way that uh, that we learn as well. So it kind of you can see it mimics the learning that humans uh, encounter as well. Fitness score about 4000. You can see there were several places it got stuck for a few generations, but it always evolved out of those ruts. Let's take a look at a few of those ruts. You can look at the top left corner of the screen to see what generation number each rut occurred on. This process of picking the fittest individuals from each generation, breeding them together, and adding random mutations very closely matches the actual process of biological evolution that took single-celled organisms and produced intelligent humans. That's the power of neuroevolution. And though we don't yet have enough computational resources to produce something on the level of the human brain this way, it's kind of neat to see what I can do on one of my favorite games. I didn't come up with this idea on my own. This algorithm is called NEAT, which stands for Neuroevolution of Augmenting Topologies. And it's based on a paper by Kenneth Stanley and Risto Mikulainen. It's a really great paper that describes how to use genetic algorithms to build up neural networks from bare bones without presupposing the best structure for the neurons and their connection. All right, so they're gonna get tactical right here, but I just wanted to show you this program just to show you how something like this would be made. So you start randomly, it's horrible at the beginning, and then it gets to a point, maybe it gets stuck, but every single iteration, they in introduce random variation into the connections. And that's basically just our way of learning. You just try something new, right? So sometimes when you get stuck in a particular situation, your only chance is to say, let me just try something new. Let me try jumping here. I never tried jumping here. Let me destroy that box. Maybe there's something in there. And that's how it learned uh, its, um, uh, its iteration. Uh, interestingly, if, you, uh, if you're interested in uh, connectionist networks, if you're interested in uh, machine learning, video games, there's a very interesting uh, paper that was published on a network that was learning asteroids. And uh, asteroids is a game. It's one of the first games, I think, that ever came out. It's been around since the 70s. So these simpler games are a lot easier to, like, code into a network, but they let the uh, program run uh, over a 24 hour period. So one, it got to the level of almost an expert player in only 24 hours. Two, it actually came up with a strategy that they had never seen before. So it came up with a new way of playing this game. And if you ever, uh, another one that's very uh, been very famously done is the snake game that uh, used to be on the old Nokia uh, phones. If you watch a computer network play that game, it is ridiculously scary how good this network can do. And it'll do things that as a human, you might say to yourself, I would have never thought to do that. So it does mimic a lot of the learning that we, uh, that we do. But also sometimes it uh, gives uh, insight into our own sort of cognitive biases that we have, our own sort of heuristics that we use that actually might be limiting our performance. And it gives rise to strategies that we might never have uh, actually uh, come up with on our own. All right, any final questions about connectionist networks before we wrap that up for today? We're good, all right. So just to be clear, that is the end for exam number three. So this is the last thing that we're gonna have potentially on exam number three. Uh, connectionist networks will be there. Uh, so now everything from here on out is uh, going towards the final exam.
So let's start on that, and we're going to take a look at chapter 11, uh, language. All right, so what are we going to look at today? Uh, we're going to start off very basically. What is language? So we all kind of know what a language is. We all speak a language, uh, maybe more than one. But what exactly is considered a language for psychologists? Uh, we're going to take a look at the field of psycholinguistics and what it is concerned with. We're going to take a look at language comprehension and specifically different phases of language comprehension. So we're going to take a look at perceiving uh, phonemes, which is the smallest units of sound. We're going to take a look at perceiving words. We're going to take a look at perceiving sentences uh, and talk about uh, you know, how uh, different uh, considerations are done for those. So we'll take a look at the COG Lab. Uh, for categorical perception identification, understanding words, understanding phenomes, understanding sentences, texts, and stories, all very complex, higher-level uh, cognitive abilities. All right, so what is a language? So the definition of a language uh, is a system of communication, uh, clearly, using sounds or symbols uh, that enables us to express our feelings, thoughts, ideas, and experiences. So that's the basic idea of what a language is. And in order to kind of help psychologists study language, they've also identified some key characteristics, uh, some key properties of human language. So again, humans seem to have a sort of special place amongst uh, the language users in our world. So bees have language, uh, apes have language, but there seems to be something that are degrees beyond in terms of human language. So they uh, identify certain properties of human language. So what makes human language distinctively human? Well, one of the first properties is the idea of creativity. So human language has an infinite set of possible statements. You will never exhaust the things that a human language can, uh, uh, can describe. You might find something that is indescribable. Right? So oftentimes we come across something where like, uh, there are no words, right? I can't, uh, I'm speechless. There's no, no way I can describe this. But there's not going to be a limit to what you're able to describe with a language. There's an infinite set of possible statements. And these possible statements, they do have a structure to them. So it's not that any a language will allow for just any random infinite combination of the words in that language. It does have a structure to it. It does have a sort of hierarchical structure. Uh, but within that structure, within that rule-governed uh, system, you have an infinite number of possibilities. So one of the big famous uh, examples of this came from Chomsky, probably the most well-known uh, linguist um, in history. And he gave an example that showed this possibility of an infinite set of possible statements, hierarchical structure, rule-governed. And his phrase was, colorless green ideas sleep furiously. And this statement makes no sense whatsoever. So colorless green ideas, right? How can you both be colorless and green at the same time? It doesn't, it violates kind of logic. However, it is a perfectly acceptable English sentence. So it follows the rules. It follows the structures. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, it was because of that, he argued that it had never been said before. So it's not that he was repeating something that had been said previously, but it is an example of that creativity. It follows the rules, but it's something that is brand new. So the hierarchical structure of this, you got your, uh, you got your sentence, you got your noun um, predicate, you got your verb predicate, and it breaks down into, if you're... Uh, uh, into grammar, into linguistics, you'll probably know what all of those are. I do not. But anyways, it breaks down uh, into this hierarchical structure. It is set in a certain structure, but you have infinite creativity within that uh, structure. Incidentally, uh, one of the things I learned uh, seriously just this year is uh, that uh, if you have multiple adjectives for a particular noun, there is a order that we accept those adjectives in um, that is different across different languages. And if you ask somebody, if somebody is uh, young and um, athletic and tall, you would say 
uh, the, the young, uh, tall, athletic person rather than the athletic, tall, young person, rather than the uh, athletic, young, tall person. There's an order for those adjectives. And if you ask the average non-linguistic, you can go as highly educated as you want, but if they're not educated in linguistics and you ask them what that order is, they have no idea. I have no idea. But we all do it correctly, right? We all make that order correctly. And people who have English as a second language, that's one of the big kind of difficulties they have because their language will have a different order. So there are rules. A lot of them are very subtle, but they are there. Next one, universality. Universality uh, is the idea, the property, that language use is universal across humans. We have never encountered a culture of humans that does not use some form of language. There are tons of different languages, but it is universal. We've never come across, again, a society where language is not used. So most languages, in this case, uh, the phrase is they're unique but different. So there is this universality, uh, but it does have a certain uniqueness to each language. There are differences uh, between them. And one of the most interesting studies about this idea of universality uh, came from Greenberg. And uh, Greenberg just took a look at all the languages in the world and said, what are the preferred orders in that language for subject, for verb, and for objects uh, across these different languages? So if you say something like John kicks the ball, John is your subject, kicks is your verb, uh, the ball is your object. So some languages in the world go John kick the ball. They go subject, verb, object. Some languages in the world go subject, object, verb. John the ball kicked, right? Some languages have other combinations. So he took a look at these three combinations and he was asking uh, of all the possible combinations. So there's six possible combinations. Are these sort of randomly used? In, our, in our, all these different languages. So our language is free. Does our brain, does our mind allow us a free selection of which one of these are we gonna use? Or is there some sort of universality? Is there some sort of rule or commonality across all of the languages? So they're unique and different, but at the same time, they do share something in common. So he took a look at these different orders of subject, objects, and verbs. And what he did was he just found a percentage of the world languages that use those particular orders. Here are the preferred subject, verb, uh, object orders. And if it was random, if there was no governing, governing kind of universal principle that guided a language's development so that any one of these was uh, equally probable, then when you take a look at the world's languages, you should see something like that. You should see an equal proportion using subject, object, verb. You should see an equal proportion using verb, subject, object. You should see an equal proportion using object, subject, verb. However, the actual results look more like that. So by far, the most uh, languages in, in uh, human languages use the subject, object, verb, use the John the ball kicked. Next uh, most common is uh, where we fall, English, John kicked the ball. Next most common would be uh, kicked John the ball. And then probably like one or two languages had uh, kicked the ball, John. And then notice we had nobody down in those final two combinations. So clearly it's not random. It's not just, you can't just arbitrarily pick which one of these orders that you want. There's something about the human mind that is uh, prefers or has a better understanding of or easier time um, processing these particular combinations. Incidentally, there is one very famous example of somebody who does do the object, subject, verb in popular culture. Does anybody know who that is? Not Shakespeare. Yoda? It's Yoda. Oh, yeah. So Yoda uses and talks in that object, subject, verb uh, order. So instead of saying something like in English, you would say, you have much to learn. Subject, you, have, uh, verb, what do you have to learn? Much, you have much to learn. Uh, you have much to learn. Yoda would say much to learn you have, right? So notice that this is, I always love it when psychology crosses with pop culture 
Because when they were creating Yoda, when George Lucas was sitting there with his creators and they had to come up with Yoda, they wanted to make sure that he sounded alien. So they were asking themselves, how can we adjust his language to how he sounds alien? And basically, they came up with a choice that was a combination that no language is used. So, of course, his speech is going to sound different. Of course, his language is going to sound different to us, sound alien, because there's no language in the world that uses Yoda speak, right? So, again, it's that idea that there are rules that can be followed, and when somebody doesn't follow it, you notice it. It just kind of feels a little bit off, uh, feels a little bit alien, and for good reason. All right, so we got universality. Um, oh, another really nice example of universality, just to kind of show you the levels at which language can develop. Uh, color terms in languages. Not all languages have the same number of color terms, right? So there are some languages with fewer basic color terms uh, than other languages. So in our language, English, I think we have like seven or eight basic color terms. So you got black, white, red, yellow, green, uh, blue, um, pink is there, orange, purple, nine, I think. And then after that, you get, you get into your chartreuse and your desert rose and all those other ones. <laughs> We're talking about the basic uh, color terms. As it turns out, not every language has the same number of basic color terms. But depending upon how many color terms they have, they have the same color terms. So, for example, Kaffi, uh, Kay and Mafi uh, took a look again at languages, and they would take a color chart, and they would just ask people who are native speakers of that language, um, they would just ask them, what color is this? What color is this? What's this color? What's this color? And they would find out how they labeled, what were their color terms for all these different colors, and what they found was that there was a group of languages that had two color terms. So that was the basic level. That was the, that was the uh, one with the least amount of color terms. And if you only had two color terms, it was light versus dark or warm versus cool. And the same colors were subsumed under those two color terms. So if you only had two, then all of your colors, if you pointed to this, they would say that's dark. If you pointed to this, they would say that's light. If you pointed to, I got something, if you pointed to this brown, they would say that's dark, right? So they only have two color terms, and those are the two. It's light versus dark, uh, warm versus cool. It's those two color terms. If you then went up one color term, if you found languages with three color terms, it was not arbitrary what that third one was. If you have three color terms, then you choose red as your next color term. So you stick with white, you split the dark into red or yellow and black, blue, green. That's your next move. So you don't get to just say, oh, I want to be a language that has black, white, and pink. That's going to be our language. You know, spread the word to elementary schools nationwide. Uh, you, this is how it develops. And if you have three color terms, sorry, if you have four color terms, then you fall into one of these three categories. So again, it's not arbitrary. You split red and yellow, or you split green, blue from black. That is your move. And then the pattern just keeps going. If you got uh, five color terms, if you got six color terms, those are your color terms. So you don't get to slip pink into your color terms until you got white, red, yellow, green, blue, and black as your basic colors. So again, something as unrelated to language as color perception still follows in your language as basic development. And if you add new terms, you add them in this very specific kind of growing uh, way. So this is another example of that universality. Every human being speaks a language and it's not arbitrary what those language structures are. All right, so those are the ideas of the language. We have creativity, we got that hierarchical structure, uh, we have rule-governed uh, linguistic behavior, we got universality where these rules seem to be spread out amongst the, uh, the world's languages where it's not arbitrary what we can do as a language. So now what we're gonna do is now that we kind of have an idea of what a language is, let's take a look at 
some of how we understand languages. So, in psycholinguistics, they have comprehension. There's different areas of psycholinguistics. We'll just give a brief overview for this. We got comprehension, how do people understand spoken and written language. We got speech production, how do people actually produce a language. And anybody here who is uh, taking their four language courses for your general education degree, you will know that comprehension comes way before speech production. And I remember when I was learning uh, Croatian, my parents were originally from Croatia. I was born here, I spoke English first and I had to learn Croatian. Um, I am not the silent type. And yet when I went to Croatia when I was a child, everybody thought I was. And I knew how to navigate the world because my comprehension was fine, but I could not think of things to say quickly enough. My speech production lagged. So it's weird in a conversation when it takes you two minutes to figure out how to say what you want to add to the conversation. And by that time, they're not talking about, you know, what you did at the beach that day anymore. All right. Next one, representation. How is language uh, represented in the mind and the brain? How do we actually code for these things? Things like connectionist networks, right? How is that actually represented? And then finally, acquisition. How do people uh, learn a language? So how is it? that children learn their first language? How is it that you learn a second language? Uh, what are the changes in your mind uh, that occurs for those uh, areas of acquisition? So we are going to focus mainly on comprehension, mainly on how is it that we actually understand these units of language uh, in order to understand these uh, communications. All right, language comprehension. So we are gonna start uh, at the very basic level of language comprehension. And one of, the, one of the nice things about language comprehension is that it does have this nice hierarchical structure. So it does have that ability for a scientist to say, all right, I can study language unit by unit because I actually know what the units are. So again, unlike the perception of smell, which doesn't have a, what's a unit of smell? Right? It's very hard to, we don't even have the concepts for that yet. Uh, units of language can be broken down into tinier and tinier pieces. So we're going to uh, take a look at words and phonemes. And we're going to see how a signal, an auditory signal, is actually broken up into these words and phonemes. So a phoneme is an important unit of language. It is the smallest unit of language that actually carries meaning. So it's like the sound. In some languages, it's a click, right? It's these smallest units that contain, uh, that contain uh, meaning. So this is a signal over here. And we're going to see that it's very challenging to parse this signal into its different, uh, different units. So this is what an actual sound wave looks like visually represented. This is the information that is hitting your ear. Right? So the closer that these peaks are spaced, the higher the frequency of the sound, the larger that these wavelengths are, the louder that particular sound is. And you can kind of see here, if I was going to split this up, I would say that there is one phoneme being said here. Right? There might be another kind of uh, auditory chunk here. Maybe this is something separate from this. This definitely looks like something. This definitely looks like something. And then I don't know what this is. This is like a hum or something, right? That's what it looks like visually. If you have to chop this up visually, that's basically what I would think visually it would look like. What this is actually a sound recording of is I am ambidextrous. So this is I am ambidextrous. And you can see that this is one word. This is another word. And then this whole thing is your third word, right? So we somehow can parse this so that this goes, who knew this was trust, right? Who, who would have thought that that was? And then also take a look at how complicated it is. This is am, this is am, right? This does not look like this. The am that is am does not look the same or sound the same as the am that is ambidextrous, right? There are two different sounding things. So that was a big challenge 
in, um, in psycholinguistics, how is it that we split this up into that signal is I, that signal is am, and then that whole thing is ambidextrous. And uh, if you don't, uh, if you're not convinced in terms of how challenging this is, think about the first voice recognition products that came to market and how often they just misunderstood what it is that you want. Think about all those times when you're on the phone and you get one of those automated calls and they're like, what would you like to do? And you're like, pay credit card. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. What would you like to do? Pay credit card. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Would you like to pay your credit card? Say yes or no. Yes. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that, right? We've all been there. This is difficult. So how is it that we can actually uh, do this? So before we get to just how this, uh, difficult this is, another nice example is the game uh, Mad Gabs. Has anybody ever played Mad Gab? All right. So if you haven't, this is a game where you get words printed out on a card that you read and your partners on your team have to figure out what it is that you are saying. And this plays with the idea of phonemes mimicking other words. So let's take a look at this and see just how challenging this can be. I'm all a machine. I'm all a... No. I'm all a machine. All right, so I kind of missed my pause there. Let's see if I can get that card back. All right, I mull of mush sheen. I mull of mush sheen. Anybody? Any ideas? I, know, I think it's going to I'm a love machine. It is. This yeah. is going to phonetically be I'm a love machine. So I'm a love machine. But love is split across the back of mull and the beginning of of. So you can see... People will actually, when you play this game, say it and not hear it. I'm a machine. I All right. So once again, difficult to parse that, right? Difficult for a computer, a, a network, to, to pick between I'm a love machine and I mull of uh, mush sheen, right? It's difficult to pick between those two, and that's why you gotta yell on your phone and eventually just say operator, 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 live person. All right, so let's take a look at uh, some psychological data on this. Let's take a look at uh, why this is oftentimes so difficult, and interestingly, what your mind does to make it easier, to make it more effective. So we actually have a property in our mind that helps us pick up our own language, and that is the idea of this categorical perception. So this is another COG lab where you have to have your volume on. So on each trial, you heard a sound. And your task on this one was, was straightforward. You just had to judge whether the sound was ba or whether the sound was pa. It was just those two. Is it ba, is it pa? Which one did you hear? And uh, you had to confirm that your volume was set. And you would hear it, and literally all you had to do was say, all right, the sound that I just heard, was that ba or was that pa? And you would do this over and over again, ready for the next trial. And uh, that was the task. Is it a ba or is it a pa? What was the independent variable? The independent variable on this was simply what is uh, simply a change in the sound information. It was just a small little change in the sound wave, and it's called voice onset time. And voice onset time was changed by five milliseconds uh, between the stimuli. So it was just a five millisecond, very short change uh, in voice onset time. And that was the only difference between ba and between pa. So this is a visual representation of voice onset time. And voice onset time is the time between when your uh, lips open 
So you got to go ba and pa. You got to start with lips closed. And then you got to pop those lips open to say the words. And then all voice onset time is when do your vocal cords start vibrating after you open your lips, right? So for ba, your voicing, your uh, vocal cords actually start vibrating before you open your lips. For pa, they actually start vibrating after you open your lips. And that is it. Everything else about the signal is exactly the same for ba and pa. The only difference is this delay here. Do you start vibrating your vocal cords after you open your lips? Exactly when you open your lips, it's still gonna hear, uh, be heard as pa, or do you do it before you open your lips? It's gonna be heard as ba. So importantly, that is the <laughs> one difference between hearing ba and hearing pa. All right, so let's take a look at these results. What did we find? So here we have the number of uh, ba responses. So um, the number of uh, instances of this cat uh, of this sound that you said was ba. And what you what you had was you had ten trials for each of these. I think ten. You might have had eleven. You had eleven trials for each of these voice onset times. So eleven times you heard the auditory signal with uh, zero um, second. Uh, voice onset time. And 11 times you heard the voice onset time at plus 5. 11 times you heard the voice onset time at plus 10. And uh, right there, sorry, it was 10 times. Right there, we have uh, chance uh, occurrences. So once again, if you did this, but you didn't have your volume on, right, this is where your performance would be. So this is the performance of somebody that didn't turn on their volume. And what you might think is going to occur here is that because this is a gradual change, right, in the voice onset time, it's just very gradually changing that voice onset time, you might expect that the number of ba responses will also gradually change, right? So the same way that your perception of gray gradually changes the more black you add to a white, you know, pigment, the way that that gray is gradually changing, maybe your perception of sound will also gradually change. So we should get a straight line, straight uh, diagonal line here, indicating how many were, seen, were perceived as ba, how many were perceived as pa. That's definitely not what happened, though. The change between ba and pa happens very slowly, if at all, and then massively rapid. So this change here is more like jumping off a cliff than it is sliding down a ramp. So what we see here, we take a look at these first three points over here. From a voice onset time of zero milliseconds, you have eight out of 10 on average being said, that's a bop. Plus five, nine out of 10 on average. Plus 10, eight and a half out of 10 on average. Notice that going from five second intervals, five millisecond intervals, from zero to 10, barely any change. So your perception of ba stayed the same with across these three units of voice onset time. All right, so a very, very small change in your perception of this sound. Take a look at the last three units of voice onset time. Across the same change in voice onset time, there's a very small change in your perception of this as pa. So now we're on the pa side of the graph. So these three units here, look at the amount of change in how often people said, that's a pa. In these three units over here, look how small the change and how often people said, that's a ba. In these three units here, look how huge that change is. That's a massive change in terms of the change of people saying, yeah, I hear ba versus yeah, I hear pa. So this is the idea that up here you're on the cliff, down here you're in the water, and this is the massively fast change when you make that switch. And notice, very importantly, this is, uh, um, this is not a gradual change. So we have mechanisms in our mind that will take gradual stimulus changes and code them in a way 
where we don't perceive a change, we don't perceive a change, we don't perceive a change, massive change, we don't perceive a change, we don't perceive a change, we don't perceive a change. And that's how our minds are wired to comprehend these phonemes. Any questions on that so far? Make sense? All right. So that is uh, what is known as categorical perception. I thought I had an explanation slide, but I'll explain it right here. So this is what is known as categorical perception. And we have a categorical boundary right there for ba and pa. And basically anything on this side is going to sound like ba. Anything on this side is going to sound like pa. And there's a small little sliver in between where we would be confused, right? So you can see here, half of the people, half of the subjects thought it sounded like ba, half of the subjects thought, thought it sounded like pa. That's the only place. Everywhere else, it's mostly ba, mostly pa. This is the idea of categorical perception, where we take a gradual stimulus and through our mental processing, perceive it as one category or as another category. All right, so that's the idea of categorical perception, and that aids in identification. So categorical perception. How might this idea of categorical perception, how might this idea of these gradual stimuli being categorized as either this or as that, how might that uh, help somebody to perceive words and phonemes if you're speaking in your own language? So any ideas on that? All right, I'll give you a clue. Human beings are some of the most variable creatures in existence. Not everybody is going to be the same, and that includes speech. So how might this help perception? So mm -hmm. Does that maybe help when there's like like differences or small like idiosyncrasies between how different people say the same thing. So like everyone says ba differently, like by just a little bit. Yep. So being able to judge it on a scale and say if it's within this category, then it's ba, even though it's not exactly the same. Exactly. That's exactly the way that it helps us understand our own language. So when we were learning how to perceive phonemes, when we were learning ba versus pa, right? Um, we encountered people that had this voice onset time when they said ba. We encountered people that had this voice onset time when they said ba. We encountered people that had this voice onset time when we were saying ba. But instead of being confused, right? Like you said ba, and you said ra, and you said ga, those things all sound different to me. In our minds, they all sound the same. So when you're talking to somebody from your own language, you have developed these categorical boundaries that fit your language. So one of the things that occurs through language acquisition is that uh, in terms of the number of phonemes that humans actually have in the world, I think the number, if anybody remembers it from the text, I think the number is something like 48. There's actually 48 distinct sounds that humans make. Uh, throughout the world. So things like, again, those those simple units of sound like s, ah, t, all those sounds like clicks, all those sounds vary across languages, right? Or all those sounds uh, are used across languages. Babies, when they're born, do not know what culture they are born into, right? Babies, when they're born, do not know what culture they're born into. And yet, any baby born into a culture will learn to speak that culture. So it doesn't matter if you are born in Japan and you're a Caucasian, you're an African American, you're a uh, Japanese uh, individual who has 12 generations of their family in Japanese. You're born in Japan, you learn Japan, uh, Japanese, you're going to learn that language and you're going to speak it fluently. You're going to speak it like a native speaker, which you are. This is done because when a baby is born, it perceives all 48 phonemes. As it learns the language, right about the age of two, your brain, much like in those connectionist networks, says, oh, I got all these input layers, but we don't forget this input layer over here, right? We never get this phoneme over here. Our language doesn't use clicks. So why am I going to devote 
my neural capacity to understand those different phonemes when we don't use it. So you actually lose the ability to perceive differences between certain phonemes that your language doesn't use. So this here shows basically what happens as you learn that language. You learn the important differences and your mind sets up a category that says, all right, in order for you to help you to understand your own language, because humans are gonna have a variable ability to pronounce these different uh, physical stimuli, everything on this side is gonna sound like one thing. Everything on this side is gonna sound like another thing because I put your category right there. Your mind says, I made a category right there. And then that simplifies things because rather than having a range of differences that you have to decode in your language, you got two differences here. This person is either saying ba or they're saying pa, and these minor differences, sorry, actually these major differences in voice onset time, you don't perceive them because it all sounds like ba to you. It all sounds like pa to you. All right, so that's wonderful when you are perceiving words and phonemes in your own language. Why would this actually make it more difficult? for you to perceive words and phonemes in a foreign language. Why is it sometimes that when you're talking English to somebody who has English as a second language, they have trouble understanding your words, or vice versa, they have trouble producing those words. So any ideas on that? Mm -hmm. They don't have as much experience, um, so they don't have that range of... No, you're, you're almost there. Yeah. They don't have the range of, of what? Of Exactly. So because of their development in their language, they have set up categorical boundaries to help them with their language, right? They have set up through their learning uh, and their development, they've set up categorical boundaries, categorical boundaries for their important language sounds. And if those categories don't match up with our important language sounds, you're going to have difficulty. So in the English language, it makes sense to put a categorical boundary right here between ba and pa. In another language, it might not make sense to put that categorical boundary right there because nobody differentiates between ba and pa in that language. So their mind might have put that categorical boundary over here or it might not even have one. And then when they're perceiving this, this is gonna sound like ba, this is going to sound like ba. 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 Because their categories in the wrong place. Their category boundaries in the wrong place. So this entire differentiation that we split into two categories, they're not going to split into two categories. And if you study differences in uh, language learning across for second languages, you'll see this in the kind of mistakes that uh, foreign language learners uh, will make. So for example, you might be able to say ladies like leopards if you're a native English speaker. But if you come from an Asian language where they don't have that categorical boundary between R's and L's because they don't use that categorical boundary in their language between R's and L's, it's gonna be very hard for them to say anything but ladies like leopards. <laughs> And the, the issue is not that they have an inability to pronounce this, but ladies like leopards and radies like leopards sounds different to us because we got that categorical boundary. For them, it sounds exactly the same. So you could, you could tell them until they're blue in the face and you're blue in the face, and you could say ladies like rep leopards, and they'll say radies like leopards. And you go, no, 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 listen, listen. Ladies like leopards. Yeah, I heard you, Brady's right forever, exact same thing. And you can go back and forth, it's not gonna help them because it sounds exactly the same. And if you do teach language uh, to um, uh, foreign uh, students, you literally have to break it down to the point where you like, you take your tongue, you put it at the back of your teeth, and then you say it. And it's still not gonna sound different to them. They'll learn to say it, but it's still gonna sound exactly the same. If you uh, take a look at somebody who has Hispanic as a, uh, or a Hispanic language, Spanish language uh, as their native language, uh, they can say ladies like leopards. 
mm-hmm. right? You tell them ladies like leopards, and they'll be like, oh yeah, ladies like leopards. But you tell them something like, uh, tell Jess the joke. And they'll say things like, yeah, tell yes the yoke. And you're like, no, 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 tell Jess the joke. Yeah, yeah, tell yes the yoke, right? And uh, it's, it's, again, the same thing. We have a categorical boundary between ja and ya, because in our language, we picked up in our language development, yeah, that's the important boundary. They don't. They put their boundary somewhere else. So it all sounds the same. Right? And you literally have to, again, say, you make your mouth look this certain way. You put your tongue in certain places, and then that will make the correct sound. So I'll give you one more, and this is one that is personally close to me, uh, in Croatian. When I was learning Croatian, there is a difference in sounds between what they call a hard C and a soft C. And... Uh, I was actually rather frustrated because when I was a child, I had to go to Croatian school. It was on Saturday mornings. So I had to wake up on a Saturday morning to go to a Croatian school to be taught by teachers who were not educated as teachers. These were volunteers. And I'm really trying not to sound bitter right now. But <laughs> <laughs> this, was, this was before streaming, okay? This was before I could watch my cartoons whenever I wanted. Anyways, they didn't understand linguistics. Why did you take Croatian? My parents, oh, okay. they're from Croatia. Oh, okay. Yep. And Canada, Canada is incredibly multicultural. So like they really encourage their citizens to kind of keep that you know culture going. So we had a Croatian school. I wasn't happy about it. Because, <laughs> you know, you but anyway. Huh? Do you still speak Croatian? I do. I haven't practiced it in a while. I speak like you such. Still, you speak so many languages. Then. Broken Croatian. I like. I if anybody here has ever seen. Uh, the Last Unicorn, yes. that Rankin Bass animated film. Yeah. I love that line about the dragon. So if you haven't seen it, they're at this carnival. There's this dragon. It's not a real dragon, but it's in a cage. And the person that's introducing the dragon says that the dragon speaks seven languages badly. Yeah. And I was always like, I want to get to that. I'm at about five languages badly. Oh <laughs> <laughs> so I can't, like, in Croatian, uh, once again, I'm I'm the, the strong, silent type in Croatian because it takes me a while. But... If you, I'm at the level where if you drop me in Croatia, I could survive. People would immediately know you're not from here, but I could, you know, I could, I could handle it. But importantly, the point for categorical perception, there are two distinct ch sounds in, in Croatian. And if you're a Croatian speaker, you have placed that categorical boundary between ch and ch, right? Uh, as a native English speaker, I didn't have that boundary. That boundary was gone. So I was sitting there, and teachers would be like, they, they would, I would literally be going through the exact same thing, where they'd be like, listen, listen, there's a hard ch, and there's a soft ch. One is ch, the other one's ch, right? One is, listen to what I'm saying. One is ch, the other one's ch. And I'll be like, I have no idea what it is. And years later, in my undergrad psychology uh, course, right? So this is like elementary school, finally university. I remember sitting in my cognitive psychology course and hearing that professor say, oh, languages have all these different phonemes. You got about 48. We only use about 20 you know, to 30 phonemes per language. And you lose the ability to distinguish between those phonemes after the age of two. And I immediately snapped back to this situation going, that's why. <laughs> like, I wish I knew at the time because you could, you could tell me ch and ch until I'm blue in the face. Again, I, could, I, I still can't tell the difference today. And to add insult to injury, both of these are in my last name. <laughs> so Yurich of each has both ch's in it. The first ch is this ch, the second ch is this ch, and all of you might have been saying it wrong this entire time. I can't tell because I can't tell the difference <laughs> between ch and ch. And again, it's because when I was learning English, English speaking said, there's no difference here. Don't put a categorical boundary there. You're never going to have to tell the difference between these two phonemes. So my categorical boundary was gone. And then when I had to try to make this distinction, I couldn't. Because even though these are physically different in terms of their sound wave, my mind said, same category, right? There's no boundary there. And that's how I perceived it. So that's one of the reasons why uh, learning a second language can be very difficult because you just don't have those categorical boundaries. Um, the, categor- the categorical boundaries, is that um, why, you know, some young children have the speech issues? 
you know, like if you're trying to correct them, kind of with the righty strike preppers or something, mm -hmm. so they are hearing it, like they think they're saying it correctly, even if it's said differently several times. I mean, for my, my son, for example, I mean, he has a few yep. letters that he's trouble saying. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, we can, like you were saying, blue, blue in the face, you know, yep. say it, and they think that they're saying it correctly. So... Yeah, so there's a number, uh, so the basic reason for that is because their categorical boundary uh, isn't where it's supposed to be. Gotcha. Um, why that occurs uh, is, is uh, there's, other, there's a, a host of reasons why that might occur. So that's one of the reasons why it's very important to uh, test your children's hearing when they're young. That's one of the reasons why one of the first things that they do when you have a newborn infant is they put those you know, um, headpieces on, and they see if the, the newborn's orienting at all to those different sounds. Because if they have impaired hearing, then when we are making those sounds and differentiating those sounds, if they can't pick up the signal difference, they're definitely not going to put yeah. that categorical boundary there. The other thing is that much like um, in a foreign language, if they find out that those distinctions are not important, uh, then they'll also won't pick up those boundaries. So that's one of the one of the concerns, um, and one of the one of the things that's actually happened to my own my own son. My own son used to pronounce things uh, incredibly well, and then uh, over the last year uh, he's gotten lazy. So he used to pick up these little flashcards when he was like two years old, and he'd be like like like, and then he'd pick up the next one play play right, and now he picks them up and he's like like. Like, yeah, yeah, like that, right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's it's concerning because we're like, well, we don't want those categorical boundaries. We don't want them, you know, because he's developing right now. And then kind of looking back on it, uh, you, you sort of wonder, like, what might have contributed to this? Because one of the things that uh, parents often go through is that you can understand your child. It's almost like they could be speaking a, a second, like a different language, but you kind of pick it up. And if you don't emphasize that, you know, uh, uh, play, right? If, if, uh, if your child comes up to you and goes, play, la, like that, and you don't say something like play, would you like to play? Well, they might pick up that that sounds not that important. And then that boundary does not develop. So knowing about these kind of categorical boundaries can help to understand but if you do have, if you have uh, an intact auditory system and you have trouble distinguishing between different sounds, oftentimes it'll be because that category, exactly. categorical boundary is just not in place. Yeah, that makes sense. He had, mm -hmm. he had ear tubes really young. So, but his hearing was fine at birth. So it was mm -hmm. like that gap between about like 15 months to a year and a half that okay. he, it must have affected it, you know, there. but. It's getting better. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, he's, yeah, you know, because, he's definitely, I mean, he's almost five, so he's doing really well. Yeah, Not yeah. quite the same as he Well, that's because you caught it, you, you caught it um, pre-critical time, right? So it's around two that your brain or your mind, uh, and I'm not, I'm not like a child development exactly, so I don't know if there's like a range to that, but two years is, is like a very critical age in our development, mm -hmm. and uh, it's around that time that your mind will say, I don't need these phonemes, I'll take these phonemes. So the fact that you caught it at about 15 you know, months uh, means that he's, he hadn't quite made it there yet, so he still had time to pick it up. Um, but uh, if you caught it after that, then it might have been uh, just like almost learning uh, sounds in a second language. Yeah. Any other uh, comments, questions about that? Yep. Um, my work study place we had the Notre Dame Center for Arts and Culture, mm -hmm. and I'm a literacy tutor there for kids that are in the South Bend school system. And um, I had a girl this semester who's in fifth grade, and she came here. Um, she started in like February. She came here a little after that, and she did not speak a single word of English. Like she could not even say like my name or like Marilla. Like she didn't know how to say that. So they gave her to me because I took three years in Spanish and take Spanish now. And we are able to now like read, write, and speak English. Like she can say things. I'll say, "How are you?" And she'll say, "Good." You know, like she doesn't okay. pronounce it right and stuff like that. But yep. I mean, she's able to like read her words and stuff. But she has sight words, which are like vocab words, and mm -hmm. like for the word "just," she'll say "just" or something like 
that, so we really have to work on emphasizing like hard consonant sounds. Yep. But she's doing it really, really well. Yeah, no, it is. And I mean, literally, you are um, making those categorical boundaries to help her understand things. And for um, for some of those, uh, it might not ever uh, sound different to her. But she can definitely, and that's that's what touches on what we talked about before, comprehension versus production, right? So the comprehension side of it, it might sound like people are saying rabies right records to you all the time. It might sound like somebody saying, you know, tell yes the yoke all the time. Um, and you'll still understand it, right? I mean, if you understand, I'm trying to think of a word where it's really a different meaning, you know, and you can't pick up on context. And we'll see that as well. You can pick up a lot of, uh, of words on context uh, and a lot of meaning behind it. But the, um, the sound of it, uh, tends to get very locked in um, in terms of those boundaries. And again, that that makes complete sense because we usually, I guess, evolutionarily learned one language, right? You learned the language that your parents spoke, and if you migrated somewhere, it's going to be five miles, you know, over the mountain, and that's about it. Um, and um, you know, and if you if you came across somebody who spoke a different language, you murdered that tribe and took their, uh, you know, took their resources. Um, so it makes sense that our minds would maximize our ability to learn our own language. And it kind of goes back to, and we'll, we'll end on this, it kind of goes back to that governing principle that I mentioned uh, early on in the semester, where your mind is as smart as it has to be, but as stupid as it can be. So it would be completely possible. And, and you know, I would have loved it. If my mind said, you know what, you're not using uh, 16 of these phonemes, but I'm going to hang on to those just in case. I'm going to hang. I'm going to reserve some processing power in your mind to just hang on to your ability to recognize those 12 phonemes, uh, those 16 phonemes. Then, when I was in Croatian class, it would have been like, oh man, ch and ch. Here we go. Thank you, mind. I, I can now understand it. Your mind doesn't. Your mind does what it needs to in the laziest way possible. It's like one of the governing principles. And right here, we have a, a perfect example of that. Instead of your mind saying, you know, let's hold on to all those phonemes and say, let's get rid of those phonemes. Instead of your mind saying, let's try to perceive these gradual differences, and say, no, different categories. Let's just make it easy. This category versus this category. And it's just the way that we, that we understand things. And then knowing that, though, knowing how we represent it, much like the work that you're doing, lets us know how to change that and how to best uh, deal with it. And uh, again, I would not, if I had a teacher that took psychology in me in Croatian school, I wouldn't have been yelled at going, ch versus ch. Like they thought I wasn't listening. They thought I was lazy, <laughs> right? I wouldn't have been yelled at. Uh, and they would have said, you know what? You're, you're never going to hear it. Let's just memorize the words that have ch and the ones that have the other one. And it would have been a, a much better experience. All right, so that's all the whining I'm going to do for today about my educational experience. Um, next class, all right? We started language. Next class, exam. And then in a week, we're going to pick up on language and start to take a look at uh, even more higher level things like judgment and decision making. All right, but other than that, we are done for the day.